The illustrious Jabba bids you welcome. <laughs> I'm going to regret this. I'm Pete Mitchell. He's Peyton Jones. And this is the Church Planner Podcast. Brought to you by Church Planner Magazine. Hey, Church Planner, this is Pete Mitchell. And this is Peyton Jones. Hey, this podcast today is brought to you by the team over at Portable Church. I know I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to pass this on to you and all the church plans that I've done. If I could go back and do one thing different, it would see revival. No, it's not that. Actually, if I could do one thing and tweak one thing, it would be to use Portable Church because they've got a system design to help you load and unload your church, just put everything in a shiny little box and get everything done, quick, done, and dusted in a way that's going to make your volunteers love you, hopefully not kiss you, because that kind of thing is not permitted, especially if you're married. But they're going to want to keep serving in your church. And you know what? That's worth the price of admission. So head on over to portablechurch.com. And give them a shout. Tell them that we sent you. And this is how we show you that, no, having Peyton do the commercial is not necessarily better. No, it's not. (laughs) But it has the illusion of being better. It's got the illusion of respectability. (laughs) Okay, so, all right, guys. Here's part two of Pete's knee story. And I think this might be like a 16-parter from from where I'm at right now. So I'm still not able to walk, still on crutches. And uh, I needed to, uh, I've been trying to get in to see a doctor sooner. So the doctor who I have an appointment scheduled for, they don't do x-rays. So like, you need to get x-rays before you come in. So we'll give you a referral over here. Go get your x-rays. When you come in, you got your (laughs) x-rays. So I'm like, all right, well, here's what I'm doing. I'm going to go get my my x-rays and then i'm just gonna like call him and be like did someone you know cancel can i get in there someone's a no-show whatever you know let me come in why don't don't put me off i can't walk i literally cannot walk and so uh i go get the x-ray and then i i I call their office and they're like oh no you know sorry uh today's a half day for us and we're taking tomorrow off because it's right before the memorial day holiday and I'm like, great. All right. So I can't get in there to see him. I'm going to call and see if I can get in to someone else. So I do a Google search. Now, here's the problem. I do a Google search. And for whatever reason, you know, like you don't really know what doctor to pick. So, I mean, how do you pick your doctor, Peyton? When are you um, going to go see one? I let Andrea pick him. <laughs> Okay, that's what Andrea do. registers for is who I go see. I do as I'm told. Well, when you got to see a specialist, like the only thing I can go by is what does the public say about you? So right. I look at all the reviews. Yeah. You know, we live in the age of reviews now. So, yeah, man. You know, you read them, and there's always those crazy people who are using all caps and, oh, he's the worst doctor. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> Right. So I was on Yelp and I'm like looking at, okay, this person has a really bad review on that doctor. And I click over and all they've written are one star reviews on Yelp. Like they must have an ax to grind with everyone. And I'm like, okay, you're out. I don't really care about your opinion. Right. So I'm doing that whole little thing. And then for whatever reason, I I don't even know what it was. I like probably was trying to find more reviews and I Google searched the doctor's name. Okay. And you know what comes up? He was indicted last year with 21 other doctors for workers' comp fraud. $40 million thing. His take was like 80000 of it. And I'm like, do I really want to go see a doctor whose interest lies more with the money than with the patient? Oh, my gosh, dude. Yeah. 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 Wow. You dodged that one narrowly. So I haven't canceled with him. Too and don't want to come to work. What's that? 
Good thing they're lazy too and don't want to come to work. Right. So then I found another doctor's office and the, so I I do have another appointment. I haven't canceled the one with the, 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 the fraudster. I'm just going to call him the fraudster. I haven't canceled with him yet just in case or whatever, but yeah, so I'm supposed to see someone else. I, they were able to fit me in a half hour before the other guy. So I do feel like, you know, they beat him out. But I still got to wait till Tuesday. So uh, we're still with the mother-in-laws while the uh, – so I'm I'm at the house. So if you hear a, a, an old lady in the background saying, here, kitty, 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 um, <laughs> just want to explain that. I, I was on mute because that was happening. It's uh, It's a cat. <laughs> Yes, you know, we had this, uh, this discussion before the podcast and won't reveal the entire discussion, but, uh, we had some laughable moments in the midst of your pain, which is what we do as best friends. But here's a funny thing. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I laid down that the genius of being Pete Mitchell is you don't go anywhere in life you don't want to go, <laughs> right? Like that's how you know you've arrived. You don't leave your house unless you want to. Yeah, because you were like, man, you can't walk. You can't go anywhere. That's rough. I go, how is this different than than any other day in my life? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, but the genius is, is you only go where you want to go. You don't go places. You have to go. You've arrived. You don't have to be anywhere. Yeah, it's true. Except for now, maybe the doctors. It's true. Well, here, here's the thing, dude. This, for me, was a real disappointment. So last night. I was supposed to go to shoot night. That's a uh, concealed carry weapons training where you get to do things like what I refer to as run and gun and, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, holster draws, stuff like that that you can't do at a regular indoor range. I, I, I was always looking forward to it, right? Because I pay the 65 bucks, man. I want to go there. I want to train. want to have fun. I can't do it. Can't do it. That this sucks, weekend, too. I was going to have a two-day rifle training. I can't go. I'm like, can you see me on crutches with an AR-15 in one hand? (laughs) I mean, talk about safety. That'd be kind of cool in a way, though. I actually see a movie script coming into being. I'm just saying, safety-wise, I don't think they're going to let it slide. Hey, if they can make Hobo with a shotgun, they can make Wheelchair Guy with an assault rifle. I wouldn't be Wheelchair Guy. Wheelchair Guy, I could actually understand. Ooh, ooh, Assault Weapon Crutch Guy. (laughs) <laughs> dude i'm gonna put i'm gonna put 30 round mags off the side of my crutches oh just, dude yeah just to tick everyone off you yeah. why don't you make your crutches ninja see to me everything comes back to ninja you know i'm not a gun guy so i'm i'm all about the ninja weapons so anyways hey man so uh well um movies solo <laughs> did, uh, you- did you hear it yeah, did you forget where you were going with your sentence when you started? I, I the hello here, kitty, 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 kind of threw me off. I'm just saying. <laughs> now, when is your I house? I can handle trains. When you is know? your house going to be done? It was supposed to be done in like March. I can handle power drills. I can handle trains. I can. Yeah, the March thing didn't happen. But you know, we should know better. Whenever they tell you it's going to be done on a certain date, it always takes more money than you thought and takes longer than you thought. And that's just the rule and the law of building. So now I feel good. But if that train conductor leans out when he's come by and says, here, kitty, 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 that's going to throw me. <laughs> just saying. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I, I totally did not even realize that last night was the night that Han Solo uh, came out. Or Solo. Yeah. See, that, that's how I know you got a bad. Well, but, but the I, thing is, I didn't care. They ruined Star Wars with The Last Jedi, and I don't even care anymore. So people I respect online, who who are traitors, obviously, for even going and seeing it. Um, no, but uh, honestly, Brandon Brooks sent me a text last night going, hey, it was it was way better than uh, the other one. The show remained nameless. But uh, <laughs> yeah, man, so that was kind of cool. And then, because uh, I wasn't sure, man, I was like, because I, I, I figured I'd boycott it, right? And uh, just wait and see if it's any good. If it's good, if they earn my return to the theater, then I'll go. But otherwise, I'm not jumping to go see this one. Yeah, well, for me, my excuse is, oh, I got to take Luke to go see it. Right. So Luke wants to dress up as Poe Dameron and go see Han Solo. 
I, hey, I figure if half of the fans stay back and don't watch it just because they're kind of ticked for a week, it'll still send a message. I think we're all going to go see it. Let's be honest. <laughs> I'm going to boycott it for, mm, I don't know, maybe six, seven days. Take that, Disney. <laughs> um, Luke goes, can we go see it? I go, buddy, right now, I can't walk to the movie theater. Like, I can't Aww. I can't walk in. I, there's no way to do it. And then Jamie, who really wanted to go see Deadpool, she goes, oh, man, that means we can't go see Deadpool either. I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm ruining my family with my knee injury. And, but, you know, if you if you wanted to have a rad costume, you could make a mean – like R two D two. If he did get a motorized wheelchair, that would be rad. I could just. Beep I, boop, beep boop. I did ask Jamie. I go, should I get one of those little scooters my parents get when they go to yes. Disneyland? Do I your just, parents have one? Yeah, my dad does. Oh, that's so rad. Yeah, but I they, can't wait to get one of those. They also I, rent those. I would literally drive that. Here's now. the problem, dude. I'm a big guy, and why is it you always see the big fat people on the scooter? And I'm like, dude, I can't go on the scooter. <laughs> Because you know in the back of your mind, everyone's just thinking, go on a diet. Like, that's what everyone's thinking. And they would look at me and go, Pete, just go on a diet, bro. Then you could walk. Yeah, yeah. But actually, to be honest, I don't. That, that's definitely not your problem with the knee. No, but it doesn't matter. It's what everyone's going to be thinking. It's like the illusion of Peyton doing the commercial better. <laughs> Hey, we didn't even tell everybody. Uh, uh, by the way, this is what we call smack talk. We are going to get into the actual church planning stuff in just a minute. What is today's topic? Well, that has to be decided by the listener. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> no, today I want to talk about creativity in church planting, creativity and innovation in church planting. Okay, and that means absolutely nothing to me. So this will be an interesting <laughs> talk. If you're like, look, that whole creativity thing, no. <laughs> All I'm thinking is this is coming from a lefty. Yeah, of course he wants to talk about creativity. Of course. That's the way lefties are. Uh, it's what we do, man. Yeah, so you got any big plans for the old uh, Memorial Day weekend? Uh, being that I only found out at the dinner table last night that it's Memorial uh, <laughs> No, Day. right? Me too. Yeah. I didn't yeah. realize. No, I, I was like, oh, and Andrew says, are you working? I said, uh, um, I no. <laughs> See, no one ever asked me if I'm working because they're kind of like assuming I don't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, you know. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, hey, guys, look, if you are going to be, real quick, I want to throw in a shout out for um, Chris Langham who is uh, the teaching pastor over at Refuge Long Beach. He has an amazing – do you hear that here, Kitty Kitty? No. That, by the way, is not part of this marketing strategy, Portable Kitty. Kitty, 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 Kitty. Portable Portable Kitty. Kitty. Portable Kitty. And uh, so (laughs) it's not one of our sponsors. Um, And this isn't a here, Kitty, Kitty pitch to get you to um, go to Chris Liam's thing, but it is. But what what it is is he's throwing a conference. Oh, that's rad! That was a bad screenshot. Why it, it really was. That's why I canceled it. It was, man. That was terrible. Um, it let me know, and I'll do like the fish lips again. That was uh, immensely popular with our listeners. Yeah, but, kitty, uh, kitty, 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 kitty. Um, yeah. So Chris Langham, he is doing a special uh, through the word. Those of you that know, he does an amazing. Um, uh, teachers training, and that's going to be June 8th and 9th. Um, the cost is $90. It's going to be in the town of Julian, east of San Diego. Again, that's June 8th through 9th. That's a Friday and Saturday. It's a two day retreat. $90 is amazing. You can go to ttw.bible forward slash retreat. And he's going to cover everything from the heart of teaching, calling of the teacher, heart of the teacher, integrity of the teacher, Holy Spirit and the teacher, sacred trust, welcome to the fight. And then uh, he's going to give you something called uh, Preacher's Toolbox. Explain the text, Bible storytelling, art of the word picture, the hook, the handle, and the object lesson. Why am I telling you all this? Not because he's paying me, because he's not cheapskate, but because literally Chris is the guy I go to to train my church planters. He's the guy I want to train teachers how to teach. He is one of the best Bible teachers on the planet. 
Do the Word gets millions of people listening to it. So check it out. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I'm not getting a piece of that action. Yeah, nor me. I'm, I can't even go. I'm speaking. All I know at- is, I, you know, here's a problem with you guys. You guys need to think through how you price things. There is no difference in the buyer's mind between $90 and $99. So why don't you just go get the extra 10 bucks? That's all I'm saying. Well, uh, okay, so I, I forgot I forgot to mention, for church planters, he's cutting the price for this, a two-day retreat with meals, bed, and all the classes to $45. That's insane. What? Yeah. TPW. Okay, see, this is why you pastors need a guy like me. You have no idea how money works. <laughs> so, uh, See, for the church planner, I would make it twice as expensive because there's going to be twice as much work with them. They're newer. They need more Julian help. Julian overnight, if you've not been to Julian, it's all about the pies. It's an old mining town. It's absolutely gorgeous. I don't understand. Uh, so how is he putting them up? That doesn't pay for I, room. I think he's underwriting it. I mean, Chris is one of those dudes, man, where he's just he just believes in church planning. Yeah, but I see, mean, here's the thing: you guys have got you guys have got money jacked up in your heads. You all believe that everyone's coming from a poverty mindset. Well, because because <laughs> you have a poverty mindset. A lot of the people from our background are. Dude, a lot of people from our denomination. Have I not? Man, have I not work. proved to you that that is not always the case? Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, so here's the deal. From our background, uh, they were and are, but from your, like, what I've learned from you, brothers, that I remember giving everything away for free. And you're telling me, no, man, look, I, trust me, these guys, you know, and I turn and look. You have heard the guys in our courses quote me over and over again with my famous line people who pay, pay attention. And the more they pay, the more they pay attention. Well, I would I would give all my training away free to these church planners, and then I would turn around. I remember you tell them, "Fine, you can do that. You can do." It. I turn around, then I look at this one that was like three hundred bucks, you know. And here's these guys taking that, <laughs> taking my free training. I remember going, "Huh, maybe I'm doing this wrong." People spend money on what they want to spend money on. Like that's Absolutely. the thing that that it's hard for us to get our head around. Hey, but you know, this is Chris's training, so I'm just saying. I I'm know not- that's what I'm just saying. That's why you need a guy like me. Chris needs a guy like me too. I'm he not available, Chris. Like you. I'm not available, but I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> you guys with your money, you guys. Hey, that's what we should talk about. That'll be a most downloaded podcast: the Church Planner and Money. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. <laughs> Already, if you're new, you've switched off because Pete and I have pretty much said things that are exactly the opposite of what we stand for, which is why I don't get invited to conferences, as I pointed out last week. What However, do, what do we say? I that? am speaking. I don't at understand the Pacific Coast Japanese conference on June 9th, which is why I can't go to Chris's thing. But uh, that's going to be in Anaheim. So if you want to come to the Pacific Coast Japanese conference, Christian conference, I'll be there. And uh, you, it would be easy to find me. I'm the guy who's not Japanese. And I'm the guy who's been invited to speak at the Atlantic Coast Chinese Conference. Woohoo! <laughs> Top you that. Not. <laughs> you, know, you have to throw an Irish, you know, or something like that. No, you, you know, you're I am Jennifer. Irish. That's what I'm saying. No. You got to say, oh, I'm speaking at the Boston, uh, you know, Irish. Why, why can't I say that? Why? Why did I, I trip on? I that? really was about ready to go down a path that I know I would know have you upset you. That I went down and you'd make me cut it all out. So I'm not. But I think I just need to move on. Yes, <laughs> you do. Because I like want to bring up something that happened in the past so bad, but I can't. The movie you were in? N- no. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> All right, move on, move on, move on. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, uh, I think it's time for us to actually get into our topic. Uh, Doc? Great, Scott. It's time for this week's topic. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about creativity and your church plant. Yeah, man. So I want to talk a little bit about innovation in church planning and what that looks like and how we can leverage that. 
I still hear hear kitty kitty in the background. Is this is great? I don't know where this cat's. I think a coyote. Ate it. Kitty 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 kitty. Good thing kitty. my mother in law can't hear me. She doesn't hear very well. But uh, I think a kitty, kitty, kitty. coyote ate it. So, anyways, the cat's never gone this time of day. <laughs> but we're going to talk about innovation in the world of church planning. I mean, think about it, right? Uh, innovation is. One of those things I think is underrated in the church. We always talk about imagination. So you're as... saying that our church needs an app. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, talk about things that didn't really catch on. It was like everybody was rushing to get the app. I remember going to senior pastors conferences, and you would see the booth there, and they'd be like, we'll build an app for you. Yeah, but for what? For your you know, church. Like, you got to have one, man. Dude, the world of apps now. Well, here's the thing. Here's what's kind of funny. Want to buy an Edsel? I, I, <laughs> the church that I go to, we uh, we still use written bulletins, man. It throws me off. I like that. I <laughs> hate it. Do you really? Yes, because I'm like, first of all, you say the same thing in it week after week. So nothing's new. And I just feel like i got to hold on to it. And my only thought going through my head is how long till I get to take this over to the trash and throw it away? It would be rad to send out an email bulletin and say, everybody pull up your bulletin on your phone. That would be rad. Well, see, that's what I think the, the app would be good for. Yeah. Is doing a an email. You're right. Yeah. That's the only way that I could see it. And then you could also, by the way, thanks for that. I'm sure the listeners appreciated it. I didn't even notice I did it. Yeah, I know. That's how. That's how... Yeah, and this anyway. is truly a relaxed kind of podcast. Okay, we'll go back into the topic. Go, go ahead, go ahead. I like, I like where you're going here. No, but I think, I think what you could also do, like, if you took the the format that we do, Church Planner Magazine, in, but you could do a weekly bulletin like that because you we can, like, with our software, we could publish as often as we wanted, and you could also live stream your uh, service in your own app in your right. in your bulletin, basically. So if they weren't able to attend. They could pop open their iPad, whatever, and and watch your your service. Well, and and I think yeah, I mean that that's a really good idea, and I think even even to the point where you had something innovative, where you basically came together and said, with our church plant, can you hear that now? Yes. What is that? It's my daughter. She's crying, dude. I can't do this podcast. I thought that was whistling. No, it sounded like crying. Why is she crying? So, so okay, I, I'm I'm a professional. I'm just gonna put my head down and keep going. This You're isn't a happening. Like Radiohead, that song had You're a You're a professional. Completely. That's the best. This isn't happening. I'm not here. That's what that's what Tommy York from Radiohead used to say over and over when he was on stage during the OK Computer tour in a stadium full of millions and millions of people. So here's the deal. Um. <laughs> Uh, where was I? So you remember you did that text-based uh, yeah. contact retrieval? Yeah. You were basically information gathering. You were like, hey, um, you know, text uh, to this, pull out your phones. That was the most innovative way ever to capture somebody's information in church. And if I plant again tomorrow, I'm using that same system. Hey, can I use that again? Um, yeah, I, I improved I it, that. actually. <laughs> I know. I know. I got the email, but... I literally am like, dude, that is the most genius way. I've never, ever had a good way of collecting people's information. The card, you know how that is. It's, nobody really does that, you know? Fill out this card and we'll give you a free gift. And it's usually a cheesy CD from the worship man. Come on, let's be honest. I don't know. Good. I've never wanted the free gift. Right. I would have been yeah. like, no, no, no. Seriously, you keep it. Hey, fill out this card. On the back of your chair, and we'll let you keep the pin. Look, it's got our church. You know what I would do? Okay, you know, I think, see, okay, that's what in marketing we would call a premium. So you give someone a premium for them giving you whatever it is that you're after. Um, We would also call that lead bait, right? So if we were, you know, running on a website, we'd have lead bait where we'd, you know, here's a lead magnet. Here's something. We'll, We'll give you this free report on whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, seven ways to ensure you don't go to hell. <laughs> that could be your lead bait. I'll never forget. And I think it pretty much sealed my doom in, in the denomination I came from. Was that time we did that thing? Or like, hey, you know, why the young people are leaving your church? Which the young people are leaving their church, but they found it super offensive. They're like, 
who is this guy? Remember, we even overheard people going, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? Well, not I'm only the guy who's going to tell you why young people are leaving your church. Yeah. Yeah. I think but I still have that. I have the original I, postcard I that we found gave it out the other day. I keep all that stuff. I keep we, copies of everything. I will say this. We got a 13% poll rate off of that uh, direct response postcard. Thir- that's like amazing. absurd. Yeah. I had people mad at me. I had, but which is good, right? <laughs> They're like, I'm <laughs> mad, uh, but give me this free uh, CD that you promised. <laughs> Right. Yeah, they, they, it is true. They're like, well, let me listen to it. It was, it was, it was fantastic. But anyways, the, um, you know, it's funny. I'm working with this, this, uh, project with a guy named Brad Briscoe. Um, he's an author. He's got a few things out and I work with him, uh, at NAM. And he basically, he had us read this book. It was really cool. And he talked about intersections that basically not Brad, but the book he had us read where often innovation comes where two different worlds collide. So if you look at like the world of Pete Mitchell and the world of, of Peyton Jones, that was an example of something kind of innovative. We were like, look, dude, give them a CD, you know, like they're not going to come by your booth. Cause I remember we had a booth yeah. and I was like, Hey, I want to, I want to let these guys know that I'm, I'm available for, uh, chatting with them, helping their churches, um, consulting. And it's a funny thing, consulting. I mentioned this on Banner Brothers. I don't think I mentioned this to our podcast audience, but I've found it super fascinating that for us as the apostolics, we are the innovative branch of the the FIST leadership model or the APEST, as Hirsch calls it, um, those five different giftings of leaders. Um the apostolic is more the innovative one because what an ap- apostolic leader is good at is crossing cultural boundaries and finding inroads for the gospel. Some people call him the spiritual entrepreneur. Not sure I really like that, but I like the idea that you are looking for opportunities. But the reality is when you are – the reason I talk about consulting is because as an apostle – we're outside the church. Not only are we meant to kind of exercise a lot of our ministry outside of the mainstream, but we've been locked out. So what's happened today is we have been asked, the apostles have been asked to come back in to consult as the church is dying. So it might, you know, people hearing that are kind of like, hey, that's weird, man, being a consultant to churches. Not really, because what's happened is the apostle is being brought back in as a consultant specifically because he is outside. If we were inside, we would be on the ministry team, but nobody saw a need for us to be on the ministry team. Therefore, now we're outsiders who consult. And if that's a way we get in to help turn the body of Christ around, then that's what we need to do. I have no issue with that whatsoever. I like it. I dig it. So, you know, but anyways, just it's kind of cool that right off the bat, you know, there's two examples of of how what you did was innovative. I think what what we would often think, Pete, is innovation is really just copying someone's idea, though. That's what kind of gets me. I actually have the postcard. You want me to read it? (laughs) Go ahead. So it's got what we call a subhead. Finally back after 12 years on the UK mission field, Southern California pastor spills the beans. Here's the headline. Free fact-filled CD reveals how to grow your church with young adults. And then here was the part that offended everyone. Um, I actually won't say the name of the city because that kind of gives away (laughs) the denomination. (laughs) So um, uh, this next Sunday morning, scan the sanctuary of your church and take notice of those that are in their 20s and 30s. Chances are you'll be hard-pressed to find many vibrant followers of Jesus in that generation. As you know from the book of Judges, generational shifts can occur quickly in a generation, as a matter of fact. Uh, Then I better avoid a bunch of this other stuff right here because I don't want to give it away. But just that that first two uh, paragraphs right there, that was what offended everyone because they didn't want to admit 20 and 30-year-olds aren't in their church. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I get you. I get you. And it's funny how that brought offense. Like everybody knows it. I mean, I literally the test was look around this Sunday and and you know that we're not reaching yeah. people. What we're doing isn't working. And so there is a need very much for innovation. Um, and, and, and so here's the deal. If you go back in the Old Testament, you find lots of innovation. Um, for example, 
Um, <laughs> you know, uh, we all read First Samuel, Second Samuel. We we learn that David was the man anointed to be king. We learn that when Saul comes to power, um, they're still under bondage of the Philistines. And so when, when David is fighting, you know, he ushers in what we would call the golden age of Israel. So he expands the borders bigger than they've ever been. In fact, um, it was through conquest and battle and he's a man of blood. Now Solomon ushers in a time of riches and prosperity on the back end of that, like never before. But David has the hard job of kingdom expansion, right? He is the pioneer. Solomon is the settler. But the reality is, is that, um, during that golden age, what, what you kind of realize it, it says in the beginning that in those days, nobody had, uh, there were no swords in the land. Literally, it wasn't because all of the swords were confiscated. Um, it was because Israel was still in the bronze age. Um, but the Philistines discovered iron. So they were an iron age people. So that was the reason that they had dominated. They discovered how to forge iron, whereas Israel was still forging weapons of bronze and weapons of bronze are much, uh, sorry about the background noise here. Um, weapons of bronze are much softer than weapons of iron. So, you look at that and then you see the, the portion of the story where David actually goes away into captivity and they becomes a mercenary for the yeah. Philistines. So biblical scholars look at that and they say, well, huh. So David became a general in the Philistine, a, a mercenary general in the Philistines army. Um, did he recover uh, or learn the art of forging iron and bring it back to Israel? And did that innovation actually help turn the tide of the armies of Israel. So when, when you look at it, obviously God in the very early days, you know, uh, it would say that the Lord came down and fought. Even David would say that he's on the battlefield and he writes these Psalms and he says, you came down and fought for us. Right? So there was this, this spiritual dynamic where God would tell him you're going to win or you're going to lose this one. If you obey me on this, you'll win. If you don't, you'll lose. There was definitely the sovereignty of God and the presence of God and a spiritual component to everything they did. But there was also an innovation aspect to, to what happened. And I think that we don't give enough due to that. Like uh, another example of that would be, for example, um, the invention of the steam engine, which the invention of the steam engine um, s- set in motion the birth of the modern missionary movement. Because suddenly... Um, you could, you know, that's when you had like Hudson Taylor and, uh, started off with, um, why am I not remembering his name? Uh, the, not Adoniram Judson. Um, oh shoot. William Carey, the father of modern missions. William Carey goes there, the invention of the steam engine. Um, boom. We've never had a missions organization like that before. It was like the Catholic Jesuits would go out, but it was very slow going. Suddenly mission exploded on the back of the invention of the steam engine. And so, you know, you, you've got to kind of look at these things and realize that innovation is often the friend of the gospel, not the enemy of the gospel. But again, when we were growing up, we were told that imagination and, you know, dreamers and all that, that, that was for losers, that the people who really got ahead were those who were going to work hard. And I'm not going to negate that at all. You have to work hard. But I think we've underestimated in society and in the church the place of creativity, imagination, and innovation, particularly innovation that comes from imagination. So where am I going with this? But step off for a second. Um, I'll just tell you a, a host of books that, that I've been reading. Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. Um, just read Elon Musk's biography. I think I've read every Walt Disney book on the market and George Lucas, of course, being a personal hero, he looks better and better with time now. Um, you, you've got all of these guys that the thing that they seem to have in common is that they can imagine. It's not just that these guys built things. They have skills as entrepreneurs. They have skills as scientists. They have skills as builders, but 
probably most important, and, and as I read this book about Elon Musk, what they pointed out about him is he imagines things. He imagines things, but then he has the tenacity to do the impossible. So when he comes and says, I'm going to launch rockets to the moon by this year, and we're going to have settlers on Mars, and we're going to have all this, he actually imagine stuff that no one else would even say was possible. Still operating NASA on equipment from the 60s at the turn of the century, which is, you know, part of the reason Elon Musk comes in and goes, I can do this different. He hits an intersection, right? He has this kind of knowledge. He brings it together with this kind of knowledge. And he imagines things that no one thought was possible. A tube, a pneumatic tube that'll take your car from LA to Vegas in 10 minutes. And he's, he's working on this stuff. And everybody says it can't be done. Tesla car, you know, uh, uh, an electric sports car. When he first proposes, people laughed at him. There's not one thing Elon Musk has done that people don't say is impossible. Walt Disney making feature length cartoons and then building a theme park, right? He says, I'm going to dig a hole in the ground in the 50s in Anaheim, California. I'm going to build this giant theme park. I'm going to dig a giant hole and I'm going to fill it with water and I'm going to take, sorry about the phone. This is the month. Wait for the voice to kick in. Here we go. Listen to this. This is fun. I hear this all day. Listen. <laughs> Can you hear all this? Are you getting this? It's it's coming through. It's not like clear. It's entertaining. So, anyways, so here you go. I, I know. Never do the podcast here again. But here's the deal. Disney the does this. His is entire all us. It moves through us, luminous beings. Are we? <laughs> Sorry. So uh, I'm going to try to talk over uh, the background here, but um, basically, his entire board says that is impossible. There's no way that you can ever do that or pull that off. And Disney goes, "Cool. Sounds like a project worth pursuing." And that became his rule from then on was unless his entire board said it's impossible, there's no way you can pull this off, then it wasn't a project he thought was worth pursuing. So here's the end result. You you, you got Disney. He's a guy they call him Imagineers. They're not just people that that can are engineers. They're people that imagine things that they can do. And so you've got that kind of innovation. All these guys change the world. Stephen Hawking, it was because of his disability where he could no longer – Okay, go, go. It's getting hard. I'm trying, Pete. I'm trying. It, you, you got Stephen Hawking. You want to say something, Pete? <laughs> any, any insight on this, brother? Help me out. Who, who is that? Is this? that your wife on the phone? No, it's it's my mother-in-law. Oh, see, so you can't tell mom-in-law to. Hey, can you go I to the can't. other room? I know this is your house. <laughs> yeah. So I'm on the phone with someone yesterday, and she goes, "Peyton, would you like some boiled eggs?" And the guy on the phone goes, "Nice." That must be nice. <laughs> yeah, I will say that living at the mother-in-law's has its perks for sure. So here, here we go. Um, and she, she can't hear very well. So she has no idea. But I'm just in the next room. She can't hear anything I'm saying. I don't know why I'm still whispering just in case it's selective hearing. But, but, but here's the reality. I love that I, I, you went full I, silent and like did the I, hand motion thing to like oh oh I just got offered a bagel so 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 I had to say you know we're on the podcast but anyways I'm not gonna have a bagel but now it it might be quieter so here <laughs> I kind of want a bagel now I I, I know the guy on the phone yesterday kind of wanted a boiled egg toasty and cream cheese like, on it sounds good hey, 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 both a hey, bagel Woo! with a little boiled egg on it and this is tough because you can't walk over there and get yourself one. That's no, like, I can't. I know. You have to like send Mayday signals out. Oh, dang. On a bagel. Dude, it's cool that my kids actually think feeding our dog is fun. Because they'll be like, <laughs> okay, who's going to help me feed the dog? Because I can't carry the bowl of dog food, the kibble, over to where we feed the dog. So, yeah. Absolutely. I need to move, don't I? I need to actually go outside with my with my laptop, don't I? I have no idea. Is it that? But you tell me. I, I can't hear what it sounds like, do you? I it probably would. It's a little bit worse than your Starbucks one. Okay. All right. All right. So 
Here's the, you know, what was our coolest one though. It was back when we had Mike Cheshire and we were in that, that place and you could hear all the ditches clinking where yeah, we were at that I restaurant. Remember that that was a cool one. It was like a Folgers commercial. Dude, that was like, know? that was within the first 20 episodes, wasn't it? It was early on, dude. Yeah. Yeah. That was kind of a cool one. I don't know. Where were we? Were we like out in like the desert or something? No, we him, only or? met him the one time. So yeah, it must have been like San Bernardino. Yeah. Something like that for a yeah. conference. Cause I remember, uh, I remember who one of the speakers was and you like didn't know who he was. And I like knew oh. who he was and I knew his story in the church. Yeah. He's, he's infamous in America. He is. For, yeah. You were in Wales. Scandal. I was in Europe. So yeah. we're meeting this guy. I'm like, who's that? And I'm <laughs> like, like Dude, you don't know him? let me tell you the story. Yeah. So, uh, I can't even remember his name now, but I do. Anyway. I don't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. So, so anyways, um, so, you know, here you got these Imagineers, even, even I was saying Stephen Hawking, when he's paralyzed, the reason he came up with his theory, his, his, um, I guess you, you want to say his formula for the origin of the universe was because he said, I couldn't, I, I had to go in my mind. And when I went in my mind, I was able to imagine things that I couldn't normally work out in problems. And so he, he would talk about going into these inner journeys in space. I know that sounds bizarre and weird, but he would say, I'll go on these journeys into space in my imagination. I would travel to black holes and unlocking his, um, unlocking his, uh, imagination and creativity in that brought him to new heights in his ability to scientifically deduce the origins of the earth. And so, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing to me that we, we see this, we see all these guys that have in common innovation. And when you look, uh, in church planting and even times where the kingdom of God advanced, that's what you see. You see where, for example, in the Welsh revival, 1904-05, the whole church service, um, it changed. They became experience meetings. Um, they they would preach, they would sing, they would pray, but testament like they just broke the mold. Like I, I remember reading about Evan Roberts. He would get up there and he would only do. Oh gosh, help me! <laughs> this computer is going outside. I'm not throwing it. I'm just traveling with it outside. So uh, literally, Evan Roberts would only do what was literally uh, what he felt spiritually led to do on his heart. Can you imagine leading a service that way? What that would look like that you – so he would get up there and he would wait and he would he would start off and he'd say, let's pray. And then um, as the service went, it was elastic and fluid. I mean that's kind of cool. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. I feel much better out here. Um, but, but again, Wesley, you know, when Wesley goes out, he, 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 he breaks everything. He goes, let's go outside and start preaching in the open air. That was an innovation and expansion. And the church grew so big that within 70 years of, of Wesley doing that, um, the, the easily the British population, I think it was somewhere around a third of the population to might have been a fourth consider themselves Methodists hmm. from nothing from this little movement with like one dude that were actually six or seven of them at Oxford um, grows into this thing where a third of the population. But it was that innovation, that ability to get out of the rut. And so I don't have um, anything really practical right now, but I think that the reason this speaks to me is because when I started church planting, it, it came out of this kind of innovation. I mean, it you was know, accidental. But before we keep going down that, explain to me more the guy who uh, just wanted the spirit to, to lead the church. How'd that look? Yeah, so Evan Roberts, he would, he would have a meeting. and There would be tons of people. I mean, they were meeting every day. Revival was happening. And he would go there, and they would just start praying. And as, as he would... As he felt led, he would preach. As he felt led, he would tell, he would say, he would announce a song. Um, it, it was just all very fluid. It, it wasn't like a set, like in, normally in Britain, you have a set, um, what they call order of service. So you start off, you pray, 
Um, then you have a hymn and sometimes they call it like a hymn sandwich. That was traditionally what was done in Britain. So you'd have like a hymn then you'd have a reading. Then you'd have another hymn. Then you'd have the announcements and you have another hymn. Then you have the sermon. Then you have another hymn and you have the benediction. Oh, you have the pastoral prayer in there in between two of those hymns. And that was a, a typical church service. And he just was like, I'm not doing that because God's in the house. And things would very spontaneously happen. People would start standing up and um, sharing their testimony or sharing about, or they would start praying out loud, not all together like at one time. But um, but that was what revival looked like during the 1904-1905 revival. Hmm. And these meetings would go on sometimes for hours but people who weren't saved would walk in, come out saved. In fact, um, the Western Mail, which was a major newspaper in Wales at that time, documented. It's one of the most documented revivals ever. The guy who um, started covering it in the paper covered it because of the crowds of people. Uh, he actually died on the Titanic. But um, he, uh, the Western Mail ran weekly coverage in the, in the major newspaper of um, – of the revival, super well documented. Interesting. Print the sermons, all that kind of, and people were just coming to faith in droves. And, and the genius of that, I think we've mentioned this before, is that you know, less than ten years later, most of those men were going to be in their graves because of World War One. Yeah. So it was a, a very merciful harvest that that came um, before before uh, World War One. But again, that innovation, that that. When, whenever the spirit moves, there's always this kind of willingness to um, kind of burst the old wineskin. So it's like this innovative thing. What Jesus did was nothing like what had come before in the Old Testament. Talk about innovation. Then Paul has the ability to innovate and improve and to change how he does things. Um, Jesus never did two miracles the same. Paul never did two church plants the same. So there's a sense in which we're not constrained. And yet what I fear for church planners is they often come into church planning with this one same model. And they think they're being in, uh, innovative and in using imagination, but they're not. You know, they're just changing the logo. They're just, you know, they've all got the same prospectus. You know, they've all got the same, you know, it's all the same, 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 um, you know. Uh, what can you do to a pair of pants? What can you really do to a shirt? Move the pocket from the left to the right side. You know, and you look at this like with the history of clothing, um, you know, it's the same kind of thing. But every once in a while, something comes like a fanny pack. <laughs> Those are coming back, by the way. I'm only teasing. But, you know, every once in a while, you see a real innovation. You go, wow, like our iPhone, Steve Jobs, another a example of a guy who imagined it first and said, do whatever you have to, to get to what I'm imagining. And that was the genius. That's why it broke the barriers, the barriers that were set by status quo. And I think we have to have this mindset with church. We need to not have these barriers. Where do these barriers come from? It's what we've come from. And so therefore we're limited by that. If we could approach it and say, and, and this is what I do with, with church planners when I'm sharing with them, often they'll call me up and say, hey, I'm gonna plant here. Often if they're coming to California, I'll tell them, okay, this is how I want you to think of your church plant. You're going to plant a church, but the one thing you can't do is start a um, – and it's funny because this I find myself on this talk. I'm sharing everything that I share with Banner Brothers because Banner Brothers is our um, our uh, Vivo course monthly call where we get together and – a lot of this stuff is coming out of that, you know, where we coach them and, and work with them. But because a lot of them are entrepreneurs, a lot of them are innovators and they're, they're, they're a lot more open to this. But uh, I just think that we need that mindset with church planting today um, to be more imaginative. I feel like I just vomited all over you. Hopefully it was good puke, brother. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm just trying to think. So, what's the steps, right? Great idea. Yeah. What's what does that mean? I, as a church planner, need to do. Like, I'm trying to think in my head. How do we give someone this idea and then then tell them, you know, go do this? Yeah. So, so here when when part of it is the lack of using steps, <laughs> you know. Yeah. 
Well, that that's part of it. And and here's what I would say is I would say kind of like um, there there's a bunch of different ways you can get there. For me, I got there accidentally by planting in a Starbucks. That was just and then I was like, well, this is how church has to be. I mean, I got through there accidentally. And I think a lot of times a lot of the great innovations like the discovery of penicillin were accidents. They were happy accidents like Bob Ross, happy trees, happy trees. You know, you, you have your little happy accidents, as Bob Ross called your mistakes. You know, you, you make a tree out of every every accident. But, you know, really, I think that like I was starting to say, I tell church planners, plan your church plant with this one exception. It's like the reverse negative of what we do. I tell them, plan your church plant, everything about your church plant, except the one rule is you can't start a Sunday service. Now, what's your church plant going to look like? Once you start thinking outside the box like that, then you've answered some of the questions you need to for reaching your community. If we could do anything we want except start a Sunday service, what, we'd start a Saturday. Service. Yeah, I know. No, That's no, no, the first thought. No, I don't mean that. <laughs> I mean, no service, no church service. What's your church plant going to look like? Then you start answering the real questions. Um, on hardcore church planning, I just interviewed uh, a couple who started a sports program after school and connected with all the schools. And they were just reaching thousands of families through that. Just started the two of them. Um, she had a doctorate in education. Again, it's one of those intersections where these two worlds collide. And uh, he was very much into sports. And so this couple just said, hey, why don't we just forget about right now? I mean, they have a church. You know, uh, you can you can hear about it in the coming month. Uh, it was a victory kids and victory church and the victory kids was their sports outreach, but it was literally just a sports program. It wasn't meant to be a quote outreach. It's how they make their living, but they also knew they're very intentional. They're like, this is business as mission. We're going to reach people this way. And it's back to front church planning, which is what you and I train people to do. And that is go reach a loss first. If you're good at it, you can have a church plan, you know, left over because there's a need for one now which is always at the heart of what you and I are trying to train people to do. And uh, even like through, as you're doing, like the guys entrepreneuring, um, they're, they're building business and clients and they're making contacts and connections. And just like how we talked last week about how one of your business contacts came to faith because you, 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 you worked with them. And so, but, but another thing that you can do is, and, and this might be a really interesting, I do this all the time, but I'm always searching in the Bible for innovative ways that Paul did things and what Jesus's ministry looked like. Like, for example, just Matthew 10. Remember that time you and I went to, um, we went to Exponential and it was at Rick Warren's church the first year that they had Expo West. And we sat in Rick Warren's thing. Of course, we had met him the night before he blew our mind. And we um, we sat in there and he just was kicking down massive amounts of incredible stuff on church planning. He was in Matthew 10 and he was like, how come nobody does this? He's like, this is how Jesus sends the 12 out. Matthew 10. Nobody does it like this. I went through that scripture with my actually Luke 10 yesterday with my team. And um, when Jesus sends out the 72 with all of his instructions and uh, man, things were jumping out and popping to me. We should do an episode on that. That would be a rata. Maybe we'll do that next week. Go through Matthew 10 or Luke 10. But just going through that and saying, well, why did Jesus say to do it this way? And what would happen if I did it that way? Looking at Jesus's ministry, what did he do? What didn't he do? What did he do that I don't do? What didn't he do that I do? And why? Even having a, a study on that, looking to the Gospels. Same with Paul. How would Paul have spent the majority? What would Paul do in my city, knowing what I know about him from the book of Acts? And again, I think once you start thinking outside of that box, and more importantly, giving yourself permission to go nuts and to think crazy, a fourth exercise is to do something like this. To do something like... Um, uh, if if people or volunteers weren't an issue and money wasn't an option, 
um, or a lack of money wasn't on Like literally there were no barriers. Money wasn't a barrier, a limiting factor. What would I do if I could do anything? Right. Um, and, and I used, you remember I asked this of our church plant because I think this is where the creative juices start flowing. So when we're in Long Beach, I threw out the example. We're going to take all these inner city kids, put them on a plane and take them to some other parts of the world. We start thinking like that. You know, I'm going to take them to Africa and let them help bring water to a village. What would that do for those inner city kids? How would their whole perspective of life change if I gave them that experience? Right. Um, put them on mission, saved or unsaved, doesn't matter. Um, those kinds of things. And so um, I used to call that exercise chartering an airplane or chartering a plane um, because it, it, it gives these crazy. It gives people permission to have absolutely crazy ideas. So if you were able as a fourth thing to do to kind of do that as an exercise, that would also help you start to think with the might, right mindset. And then from there you can work with, then you can start a separate list. What are the barriers to doing this? Then you can start looking at it. How could we modify this? Where, where's, what's the core of this idea? And how could I do this on a manageable, workable scale in my neighborhood where my church plan is then? Does that make sense? It does. Praying for your elephant. Yes. That's the first thought that came to my head is, okay, so you pick some outrageous thing, you write down your barriers, and then you pray for your elephant. And yeah. if you don't know what I'm talking about, guys, you need to go back and listen to some podcasts. That's all yeah, I'm saying. Adam Stadmiller, buddy of mine yeah. in San Diego. Good friend of mine. Actually, Andrea's best friend is uh, married to that, that feller. So... Yeah. So, um, yeah, praying for your elephant, you know, that, that's, it's where he just goes, what's a big audacious prayer that I could pray? Cause my prayers are too small, you know? Yeah. This big giant thing that actually takes faith for you to keep praying about it. Cause it's too big for you. It's that kind of idea. I like it. Well, man, look, I, I think I'm out. <laughs> I think I I'm it. out of, out of wind. I think I brought out of you what I needed to bring out of you. Cause you went you off did. there at the end and you, you gave us what we needed. We're so good together, man. We should do this podcast more. <laughs> Five years on, eh, maybe we got a little bit of money. What I think is yet. funny is we actually had someone who wanted to buy our podcast, and they said, but Pete has to go. can only be Peyton. And we and said they, no. Really? They said that? Yeah, why, why do you think I didn't bring it to you? It was a good offer, too. You would have been making six figures. <laughs> they can't buy me, but seven maybe. <laughs> <laughs> they can't buy me for that. <laughs> well, hey, this has been the most distracted, noisiest, most mother in law y podcast ever. But I got a bagel waiting for me, folks, so I got to go. And it might or might not just have some boiled egg on it. So well, this has been Pete. Oh, go on. We, we, I was just going to bring out, though, like if you got all this kind of stuff going on in your life, you might need a little bit of help. Maybe someone who could make your life a little bit more simply. No, oh, my mother-in-law doesn't do that, Pete. Simplify Church? Oh, 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 oh okay. Yeah, yeah. SimplifyChurch.com. And what do they do for us, Peyton? <laughs> you know, they help you keep compliant with all your IRS needs, help you deal with your admin, uh, even payroll. They'll set you up on that, and uh, they now provide uh, assistance. I have one. They're amazing. You should get one. They're amazing. Oh, hey, and by the way, guys, um, SimplifyChurch.com. Check it out. One thing Pete and I never asked for, and we probably should, is – if you like the podcast and you get something out of it, um, leave us a review. And by the way, I only have 30 reviews of my book. My book, check this out. Church Zero sold, uh, I don't think it sold as many as Reaching the Unreached. Yet Church Zero has 130 reviews on Amazon. And Reaching the Unreached has 30. So I am actually plugging you for reviews. I saw Alan Hirsch ask people to help him get over 100. Hey, I'd just be happy if I got over 50 on this book. So if you listen to the podcast, you want to give me a review. I know Pete won't because he's not in it. Actually, I didn't name anybody in the entire book. That was purpose, purposeful. Because I named people in the first book. They go, hey, you didn't name me. Pete's in the first book, by the way. I actually named him and his company. But go on to Amazon and leave me a review. He's speechless. He's not going to say anything. <laughs> you want me to end it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, this has been Peyton Jones, Pete Mitchell, reminding you if you want to reach the ones nobody's reaching, you need to go where nobody's going and do something creative that no one else is doing. Ba -ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba -ba, Church Planner Magazine.
Thanks for joining us for another weekly episode of the Church Planner Podcast with Pete Mitchell and Peyton Jones. We'd love to hear your comments on this episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Visit us online and let us know what you thought at churchplannerpodcast.com. If you subscribe to us via iTunes and have enjoyed the podcast, leave us a positive review. The more positive reviews we receive in iTunes, the more iTunes will promote us to other church planners who would benefit from this show. This podcast is brought to you by the Church Planner Magazine, which is available in the iTunes newsstand or online via churchplannermagazine.com. Thank you.